Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, depending on where you're joining this webinar. Welcome to LM News special panel discussion on global marketing. My name is Young Sun Pak. I'm a professor of international business and management at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. I'm also director of the Center for International Business Education and Center for Asian Business. Today's program is funded by grants awarded by the U.S. Department of Education, as well as the gift provided by the D.K. Kim Foundation and sponsored by the LMUM School and Brand LA, which is a nonprofit organization that supports U.S. global competitiveness through increased marketing literacy. D.K. Kim Foundation has been a gracious benefactor of the Center for Asian Business for the past seven years to promote better understanding of important issues involving the U.S. and Asian countries. LMU is one of 16 universities in the country that has received the prestigious cyber grants. The LMU Cybe serves as regional as well as national resources for students, faculty, and business community through international business education, foreign language training, and research capacities. As part of our mission to help improve global competitiveness of the U.S. businesses, LMU Saib has been offering special lecture series and webinars on various topics of international business, such as global marketing, global supply chain, and global talent management. Today's webinar topic covers a very timely and important marketing opportunities and challenges facing American companies who are eager to expand their businesses into Asian countries. The panelists will not only discuss how U.S. companies can make the best use of their global or local brands in approaching Asian markets through technological innovations such as AI and effective brand positioning, but they will also explore how Asian companies can tap into new markets and opportunities in the U.S. So they'll look at both ways to mutually benefit U.S. as well as Asian companies and economies. Now I'd like to introduce our moderators who will lead the discussion with our panelists today. First, Dr. Andrew Wong is a professor of marketing and co-director of LMU's transformative M School program, which helps to build future leaders in creative marketing industry. He teaches courses in adaptive media analytics and his research examines consumer usage and acceptance of new media such as mobile and social media marketing. And next, Professor Matt Stifel is a strategist with over 20 years of experience in the creative marketing industry. He joined the LMU as a full-time clinical faculty member 10 years ago to build and lead the M School program together with Professor Guam. Before joining LMU, he served as Executive Vice President, Director of Strategic Planning at LA-based Daily Advertising. He also worked with world-class advertising agencies, as well as global companies such as Google, Toyota, Nestle, and Bank of America, to name a few. Andy and Matt, now I'd like to turn the program over to you. Would you please introduce our panelists and start the conversation with them? I know you have prepared the great questions. Thank you. to our global marketing Sorry, webinar. I, I just unmuted, start all over, strong start. Okay, thank you, Dr. Peck. Um, we too would like to welcome you to our uh, global marketing webinar sponsored by LMU Center for International Business Education. The theme of today's webinar, as Dr. Peck mentioned, is Brands Beyond Borders, Bridging Opportunities Between the US and Asian Markets. Um, as mentioned, my name is Andy Rome. I'm here with my colleague, Matt Steffel. We're faculty within the marketing department here at LMU and we co-direct the M School program. Also a special thanks to our CBA leadership team, including Dean, Associate Dean Josh Spitzman and Dean Dale Smith, along with Young Sun Pak and Jennifer Tyler for the opportunity to bring together this amazing panel to talk about unlocking new markets and opportunities as it relates to global marketing. And thanks to all of you for attending today's webinar, including our undergraduate and graduate students, faculty, staff, and our industry friends and partners. In putting together today's program with a truly amazing panel representing a diverse set of perspectives and experiences, we're inspired by the question, what does it mean to be a global brand today in the year 2024? Here's a fun fact. 
A recent study highlighted that the cumulative value of the top 100 global brands rose almost 6% in 2023. And another study showed that global brands are viewed by consumers as possessing the power to make the world a better place. So bringing a global so being a global brand brings great opportunity and room for growth. Now let's introduce our four panelists. Uh, first, we have Ivy Adias. She's the founder and CMO of Brand LA. It's a 501c3 nonprofit marketing communications agency serving local and foreign companies, as well as government, education, and small business partners. It offers strategic consulting services, as well as marketing communications, branding, market research, and PR solutions. Welcome, Ivy. Next up, we have John Coelho. John is Group Account Director at Team One, working with Marriott International um, and Expedia Global, and he's held senior level positions at world-class agencies such as Team One, RPA, and Saatchi and Saatchi. Oh, and he's also an adjunct professor here at LMU. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome Celine Chai and Brian Lin, co-founders of the Gen Z agency called 98. Why 98? Because that's when they were born. Uh, both Celine and Brian are recent 2020 LMU graduates and former Star M School students. Upon graduating, Celine and Brian, along with other M School alum, Gia Lee, founded 98 to be a future-focused global creative agency that creates collaborative relationships between Gen Z, Gen Z and other brands. Uh, so let's see. We got a pop quiz here. Um, Andy, do you want to walk us sure. through? Sure. We're going to answer this a little bit further on in the webinar, but the pop quiz is what Asian countries have the greatest number of foreign owned enterprises or FOEs doing business in the state of California? So instead of putting your answers in the chat, why don't you put them in the Q&A? Great. And we'll, uh, we'll tally these up. And we'll get to that in a few. Terrific. Uh, so Dur uh, go ahead. Next slide. So why is this theme of bridging opportunities between the UN between the US and Asian markets important? There are five reasons. One is it helps create jobs, promote innovation and improve competitiveness. Uh, number two is to provide access to massive and growing uh, markets. Reason number three would be to enhance economic diversification. Number four, to spark innovation and collaboration. And number five, to gain access to resources and talent. So again, we think that this is a really important topic for, uh, for our discussion today. During the webinar, we're gonna be shifting between slides and panelists. So we're going to use the slides to show some key data and to act as signposts for our questions and our prompts. Um, okay, so let's go to our first question. So I think we're gonna talk about global to local. Yeah. Um, so the theme, another kind of underlying theme for today is uh, global, local, and what we call global or hybrid marketing. Uh, global marketing would be, would be where brands and companies um, take a very centralized approach to their marketing around the world. So it's a one-size-fits-all approach to marketing and branding and advertising where what we do in one market um, is the same as what we do in another market. And then, Matt, there's local Sure. There's uh, local or localized marketing is where brands are heavy on the local and light on the global. It's a great, the great thing about a localized strategy is that it taps into the preferences for brands that are perceived on a local level. The drawbacks are that it can lead to inconsistencies in strategy, execution, voice, um, and can kind of make brand identity a little bit muddied from a global standpoint. And then there's the hybrid or localized approach, which is a mix of central and um uh, local creative messaging, product development, the all the all the aspects of of marketing. Terrific. Okay. Um, and I thought maybe Ivy to put you on the spot very quickly. Um, if you wanted to share, uh, if you had a chance to look at the Q and A, and also maybe an opportunity to share what the answer was for the quiz. Excellent. 
So let's have a look. Answered. Yeah. Oh. Oh, oh there's, there's a chart later on for yeah, you, Ivy. We'll, we'll, we'll get, get there in a minute. Okay. We'll, we'll get there. Yes, I, I I don't see the the answers um there, for there, some there. reason. Yeah, well, we didn't mean to put you on the spot. We'll get we'll get to the chart. <laughs> of right. course you did. <laughs> uh, so all let's, right. let's get started. Terrific. Um, our first topic. What does it mean to be a global brand today? Uh, we're trying to manage and control your brand with an iron fist and putting your stamp of approval on every campaign can be inefficient and ineffective. And let's start with John on this one. Sure. Um, I think the desire to be a global brand while trying to control um, how your message is um, you know, perceived or delivered in different parts of the world to that level of consistency is a, probably unrealistic, and B, not the right way to go. And it goes back to your point about localization, where um, you know there are those trade-offs where the, the benefits of having that uniformity um, and consistency worldwide is that it, it um, supports the pillars of brand development, right? Which is that unified understanding of what your brand stands for. The challenge is, is that... Um, it has a level of receptiveness from, from country to country or from like regions within each country. So being able to adapt it um, to those places in a economic environment where it's becoming more and more borderless, where the consumer experience with your brand is accessible at any given time, being able to to be able to control what matters is what needs to be focused on. So things that are non negotiables like what your brand positioning is, what your brand pillars are, what your tone and manner is, like being able to control that relentlessly while still being able to give the flex um, to a local region or country to be able to um, infuse some of the nuances that adapts those non-negotiables to um, a local market. So the reality is, if you're going to try to control with an iron fist, be very deliberate with what you're trying to control and and control what counts and give the freedom to either local marketing team or product development team to interpret those things or give the flex to, um, you know, resonate with local consumers. Thanks, John. Uh, Ivy. So John talked about sort of we're living in a borderless world, but there's this need to have control and consistency, but also flexibility. What are your thoughts on sort of the tension between them? Um, so I agree with everything that John said. And I remember from last year's global marketing webinar, this was an important topic. And we kind of drilled down a little bit on um, the importance of being very fluid with the strategy for um, a hybrid type of approach especially depending on what industry you're operating and in what markets you're going to. So um, from our standpoint, every time we come across companies that are trying to, for example, expand their operations into the United States, specifically into California and specifically into Southern California and Los Angeles, um, that's a recurring question from marketing teams, from marketers, from brand managers, from the C-suite, essentially. Uh, how do we do this? And what are the things that actually matter? What would you recommend? What infrastructure do we need? And so forth. And equally, when we find companies, especially startup companies that don't have a very mature um, marketing infrastructure, uh, all of these questions become really, really relevant. So our recommendation, our point of um, strategy at all times continues to be uh, from a business intelligence standpoint, where are you trying to get, how fast, and what's the plan? And because of these companies, especially startups are still in the funding rounds and so forth, there is a very strong need for 
a very strong commercialization strategy to present to investors. So it is important that they answer that question even prior to going seeking funds to um, expand where they need to go. So overall, you know, based on our primary research and our day-to-day -day conversations with founders from various industries, this is one of those questions that um, require a very data-driven approach that a lot of leaders, company founders, company owners don't necessarily have figured out. So it's, it continues to be... Um, one of those important questions that needs to be reviewed um, every so often. Uh, we're going to turn it over to uh, Celine and Brian. And also just fun fact, just thinking about not only brands with borders, but workers with borders. Celine, maybe you want to share where you're calling in from and sort of what your life looks like a little bit. Yeah, um, I have taken remote work to the next level. I am currently dialing in from Malaysia, which is where my parents live. Um, for context, I 98 doesn't have a home base. We're based in LA, but everyone works from home. Um, we kind of don't care where anyone works. Um, last year, I took 33 flights. So that just goes to the extent of work follows me everywhere kind of thing. And just being able to immerse ourselves in different cultures while, you know, still still working is, is a really fun opportunity. Um, I think for us, we work a lot on digital platforms and social media. So we collaborate with a lot of creators, micro to macro influencers. Um, we're seeing that a lot of the influencers we work with may not necessarily be from the US or even been to the US, but their audience is very much North America based. Um, so it, it goes to show what John was saying about like a borderless world where people can have influence on different regions and countries. Um, without even being physically present there. And I, I think the world of social media has really opened the doors to allow that to happen and, and create um, a very communal creative space. Question is, you know, given that everything, almost everything we do in marketing and branding now is digital, do you think that makes this equation of, do we do centralized, do we do localized? or is hybrid a better approach? Does it make a hybrid ap approach easier or more effective given that you know we can change communications and change things um, in a nanosecond? I would say so. I think in the age of social media, um, definitely like information and just trends in general move so fast. So being able to adjust your campaigns real time and making sure that um, your audience is receiving your campaign well is definitely key to um, success on social media, which uh, does make a hybrid approach uh, much more accessible as well. Great. I'll just add, not just in social media, like the, the digitization of comms, if you will, like really has enabled a test and learn approach. Like, back, you know, back, back, back with brand building, like you had to really track um, consumer sentiment over extended periods of time. Um, but now like you can drop things into a marketplace and see, see how, you know, the marketplace responds either through, you know, social media, through engagement or through visitation or through, you know, sentiment by what is being said. Um, so I think it does add that fluidity and that flexibility um, in, a, in a beneficial way. Awesome. We're going to go to uh, another question. On one hand, what are the important considerations that U.S. companies must consider or assess to do business in Asia? This would be a really good one. Let's start with Ivy on this topic. Thanks. Yes, that's... Um sort of super important. There are a lot of elements and we should start with the sort of protégés of what companies um, do well in Asia. So that's, that's, that's the first thing. So, and when we look at that, um, we look at innovative companies with unique products and services. We look at adaptable companies with a strong understanding of local cultures. 
uh, strong brands with a reputation for quality. We look at companies with a long-term commitment to the Asian market. So um, that's kind of where we start. Who are the players that are succeeding? And then we look at what are the important factors that sort of um, enable that success. And so um, the important part is, especially from the marketing and branding standpoint, um, number one, the strategy that we talked about and, and, and answering those questions, but also uh, what infrastructure those companies have to succeed um, in the market. And from a very specific sort of cultural sensitivity, how, how are we going to get there and, and what are we going to do to connect with the market? Um, how are we going to do, uh, what tactics are we going to sort of deploy? What um, channels are we going to sort of uh, utilize for, for this success? So there's a ton of um, elements that come into that equation. There's a need for very um, exhaustive market research. And I believe that market research um, continues to be one of the things that marketers in general or companies expanding need to take very seriously. Um, we see that the most responsible companies, the most successful one actually budget for that. Um, and there are other companies, depending on the industry, that don't consider market research as, or so, so some elements of it, um, they will prioritize, but not others. And so in general, um, the, I would say um, companies that are trying to follow in the footsteps of the giants that are already operating in Asia um, have to go through that process of validating what exactly do they have or need to have in order to get there. And we're going to see success from big companies. We see, especially in our position, being in California, there are very ambitious, smaller businesses that want to sort of kind of jump the you know, the ocean to, to try and be in different markets for the obvious reasons that that expansion entails. And sometimes we have to do the strategic assessment or off. Yeah, just because you have an entry from this angle doesn't mean that when you get there, you're going to make it. So what are the things that you actually need to be looking into and at in order to, to make yourself a sustainable brand, not just a business making money in a market? And if you don't have the commitment to actually go there and be there and force those relationships and foster those, um, even knowledge about regulations and things that you need to do and who are, for example, the voices of the internet in the market, who are the actual influencers and, and do you have the budget to do that? And do you have the budget to deploy the technology that is required to actually get to where you need to get? It's gonna be um, a challenge. So. You know, the, the short answer to the question is, there's a list of um, tick boxes companies need to sort of go through in order to assess if if that's a viable option. And that also works the other way around. There's a ton of Asian companies that want to come to the US market and play here. And, you know, you know I'm, I'm assuming that that's another question that we're sort of going to discuss here. But um, in a nutshell, um, th there's a lot of cultural sensitivity that needs to be evaluated commitment to the region that needs to be evaluated, infrastructure that needs to be examined, and, and obviously whether there is a, a, an actual um, commercial strategy that resonates with the market that you're trying to get into. I'm reminded of my intro to marketing class where we teach the PESTEL SWAT, PESTEL, political, economic, societal, technological, legal, um, environmental, um, external forces. Uh, and I'm also reminded of, which is not necessarily Asian market or not at all Asian market, but when uh, Domino's went to Italy and then failed. So um, I'm sure their market research told them that they had a shot at selling pizza in the uh, epicenter of pizza, but it didn't work and they had to close up shop. Um, we're going to go to uh, the other side of that coin, which is on the other hand, what are the important considerations for Asian companies when entering the U.S. market and also Southern California considered a validation market. I want to go to you, John, on this one. Uh, you've had some experience uh, managing uh, Asian market brands in U.S. 
um, consumers and launching them? Actually, the other way around. So I, if I could just quickly expand oh, and on what IV just said um, before even addressing this, like the points she made as they enter Asian markets, all of those like factors in terms of like market viability um, and opportunity are absolutely right. Um, the the other piece though is the operational side. So, you know, if there is that market opportunity, if it makes financial sense, if um, economic sense, if there is a, a seeming market for it, getting making it successful is also very much reliant on the the people and the culture of the of who you work with locally. Like in my case, like for context, the reason why I'm part of this panel is I spent three years in Tokyo and I was sent there um, to help Lexus unify its brand worldwide because it was very fragmented. Like the experience with the brand in China was different than the experience with the brand in Japan versus the US versus Europe, et cetera. Again, back to the whole borderless situation. Um, and what I quickly learned when I was in Tokyo, is that my way of working, you know, the things that we hear that, you know, I was rewarded for while working on the Lexus brand here in North America at a national level, the entrepreneurial spirit, the, you know, out of the box thinking, the ability to find shortcuts, um, all of that fell flat when I took my business approach to Japan. Because the things that are rewarded there are compliance, rule following, um, like the idea the, of nimawashi, where you have to get consensus before you go into a room is very much a real thing. So like my uh, westernness of wanting to be quick and decisive of calling out like yes or no, it, it didn't work. So I had to very much adapt my working style in order for the desired outcome, which was brand unification to be successful because I very much needed these local market experts in order to move a project forward, but I could only successfully move a project forward if there was a common and respected way of working. So for American businesses seeking to expand in Asia, having a clear understanding of what operationally, because you will most, more likely than not have to rely on a, a local working staff. If, that, if the, that cultural understanding is not understood or used in a way that is of benefit to all, it's gonna make it a lot harder for you to achieve the success that you're looking for if it's not understood and respected, so. I'm flashing back, John, to when we did the uh, creative, remember we did the creativity workshop Yes. in Tokyo and so we ran some it was a, a workshop on inspiring creativity and the 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 Japanese employees at the agency had a very different perspective on their own ability for generating creative ideas and whether or not it was their role even in an exercise where they were given total freedom to come up with creative thinking they were like oh this isn't comfortable for me I, I got to witness some of that firsthand. How about the flip side, John, for bringing that Japanese brand in this instance to the American market? Like what were some of the considerations? Well, I think a lot of that still holds. I mean, in the case of, like, I'll use L'Oreal, when I worked on L'Oreal and the Shuamora brand, um, just being able to, and I'm, I'll speak to it from a branding perspective versus an operational perspective, but it is, understanding what is appealing about like the the foreignness of these brands and how it, it and how it can be compatible with like what is not currently available here in the US so for me for my personal experience with in my case Japanese brands coming into the US it's like where can you you know add to the a lifestyle of someone um that currently a domestic brand can't do Mm. bearing you know doing that market analysis to understand like where is that sweet spot um for that brand here in the u.s uh 
Brian and Celine, uh, pick a pick a side of that coin, whichever one you want to reflect on. Um, Asian Amer Asian brands, American brands in Asia, Asian brands in America. Um, what are your reflections? Um, I think just thinking about um, entering like into a new region or new market, um, being very deliberate about the target audience that you want to reach. Um, I think at times we always tend to generalize like entire regions um, when thinking like, oh, like, let me just target America or let me just target Asia. And uh, it definitely needs to be much more specific than that. Um, like humans are humans everywhere. So they have their own unique preferences and um, interests. So it's much better to uh, work along those lines um, in addition to considering the cultural and um, geographical um, differences, but making sure that you're really um, hitting those human elements as well. Of that. So Brian takes a very consumer centric approach. Celine, any thoughts? Yeah, this is like less about what we do at 98, but just more of a personal experience. I, I obviously live in Asia. I travel Asia a bunch and I see a lot of American brands in Asia. Um, and I think there's already an allure of an, a West to East sort of um, navigation. So I know Blue Bottle is a good example. I know there's roots in Japan, but also it's, you know, everywhere in California and it's just a normal coffee shop. I mean, it's an elevated coffee shop, but it's pretty normal. But if you see Blue Bottles in Shanghai, it's an architectural, you know, galore, basically. there's It's a standalone structure. There's a whole bar set up. And so there's levels of luxury to it that, you know, we would see as an ordinary situation here in the, in the States. Or the other day I was at a mall in KL and it was like a coffee shop called Reborn Coffee. I had never heard of it. But apparently it's from L.A. There's a branch in Manhattan Beach, Arcadia, like a bunch of different brands, branches, Redondo Beach. And the line for this coffee shop was out the door. And it was, you know, the allure of something from Los Angeles. And it's hard for me to put myself in that perspective because I've lived in L.A. for five years for college. And just to think like people fantasize over a lot of American brands. It's a dream. It's the movie aspect. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a little bit of an advantage coming west to east, but there's a lot of areas to mess it up um, if you don't end up taking that global to local um, navigation. Um, I wanted to add something, um, guys, um, in, in relation to just, just very briefly, just to sort of kind of, if you wish, mentally bullet point a few things, uh, especially if I mentioned companies come in here, um, just in general, you know, familiarizing um, companies to familiarize themselves with, with, with the complexities of some of the things that happen in the U.S. and, and how consumers behave um, in the U.S. And, uh, you know, what to Brian's point, how people shop here, for example, for the retail industry or strategic alliances. What, you know, who should you be partnering with or what type of established companies um, should you be going for when you want to, for example, tackle your distribution marketing or co-branding um, sort of to accelerate a little bit your entry. But uh, also in regards to product and service adjustments, um, you know, the U.S. market has completely different uh, needs and regulations and preferences that require adjustments to existing offerings. And so navigating that um, space can become a little bit um, challenging sometimes. At a more marketing granular level, so there are very specific considerations in regards to website and SEO. Should you have your US focused uh, website optimized for American search engines, for example? Um, and this is crucial for visibility for potential customers and social media strategies. Um, what I popular platforms in specific countries in Asia are not the same as the US. And so you have to sort of transcreate all of that to be able to succeed here and build your presence. And so also the influencer marketing aspect of it, um, you know, partnering with relevant influencers for your specific industry uh, to establish your credibility is, is a must here. And also uh, one 
interesting bit of you know the social proof side of things, especially for the U.S. American consumers often rely on reviews and testimonials and a ton of stuff that validate those brands. And so to be proactive with that would be something that we you know would highlight or you know red flag for any Asian company that is trying to to sort of come here. Sorry to come. Follow up question for. Asian companies looking to enter the U.S. market, would you consider California as a validation market, a way to validate? Absolutely. I mean, just um, data alone tells you, and and we're going to get to the results of the quiz that you put um, when we first started. It's kind of fascinating. So uh, California has a GDP as of 2023 of 3.89 3.89 trillion dollars and that makes it the largest economy in the United States and the largest subnational economy in the world. So if California was a country it would be the fifth largest economy globally uh, bigger than India bigger than the United Kingdom. And so if you're trying to validate um or look for a market where you want to play and and be exposed to you know literally all types of consumers, to put it that way, but also to make your presence solid in this market, absolutely, it it is a resounding yes. We see a lot of um, European brands come to our agency asking for advice, in particular, uh, where should I come in? And obviously, that's not one size fits all. We have to evaluate what industry they're in and what infrastructure they have. But as a I would say 70 to 80% between that bracket of companies that make it here are actually successful in the rest of the country. So if you come to California, specifically Southern California, and um, I don't know when you're ready to to talk to, to speak to that particular slide that reveals what is the number one um, Asian country that has number one presence in California. There is a reason for that. Uh, there is a reason that particular country is here and has the highest number of foreign-owned enterprises and provide the highest number of jobs with the highest number of wages. And so this is data that the World Trade Center provides in the California Foreign Direct Investment Report every year. And that fluctuates, those rankings fluctuate, but there is always an Asian company at the top. So and- looking at the Q&A, we have Japan, China... Also Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, India. Should we reveal? Let's do it. A lot of people got it right. <laughs> so, yeah, a lot of people got it right. The number one is Japan as of 2023. And so, uh, you know, that's not a surprise. Japan um, has a GDP of $4.4 trillion as of 2023, and it's the third biggest economy in the world. And when you look at it specifically, their presence in California, in Southern California, they're number one. If you go deeper into that data that the World Trade Center produced, they have number one presence in Southern California. They're in second place in the Bay Area. (laughs) So this is a ton of stuff that um, is kind of interesting to look at and what type of um, industries what are those jobs coming from? Where are those, uh, you know, what are those enterprises? And and so it's a lot of, I would highly recommend for anyone who's interested, speaking of market research, to create these alliances between Asian and US companies and where are you going and where are you coming from? Just check out the Los Angeles County Economic Development Corporation's its subsidiary World Trade Center. The foreign direct investment report is super, super, super useful. There's a lot of interesting data there that um, anyone who cares about market research should consider in order to make a data-driven decision. Thanks, Ivy. Awesome. Let's see. I think it's me now. Um... Where are we, Andy? Are we on the next, the next the next question? All right. Sorry, I've got too many. I have too many Zoom things. Um, okay, so this is uh, for U.S. companies. Actually, I can't see this. Sorry. Um, sorry, friends. Let me try this one more time. Okay. 
shot. Sorry, Zoom rookie here. There we go. All right, for U.S. companies entering Asia, is it important not to view Asia as a single entity and really understand the cultural nuances that can make or break a campaign or launch? Let's open with uh, let's open with Celine and Brian on this one. You want to start? Do you want me to start? Uh, you can start. I mean, yes, I think it's extremely important to not view Asia as an entire entity. I think on a human level, too, when you have to fill out those ethnicity cards and it's like, you know, you just took Asian and it's like, I feel misrepresented because Southeast Asia is extremely different from just Eastern Asia and so forth. So I think every market is approached differently. Um we use different forms of technology and apps. For example, in Southeast Asia, we don't have Uber. Uber was bought out by a local um, rideshare company called Grab. But if you move to, if you go to China, they're using an app called Didi. So like everything is so, like we are a large continent with many, many separate markets and um, individual experiences. And even if you look at fashion too, the, like, you know, Japanese fashion versus Korean fashion versus Thai fashion, like they all are extremely different. Um, and so it, to, to the point of even just like looking at the United States, like we can't view all of California as the same either, or, you know, coastal versus um, middle America looks very different. And yeah, I think there's a lot of nuances to be considered for American companies. I think there's always this approach of, oh, let's expand to Asia and like just go straight in. Um, I think it's, you know, it's a good strategy to prove yourself in a specific Asian market before considering expansion. Um, yeah. Brian, do you have anything to add? Yeah, um, I pretty much agree with everything that you said. Um, I think additional consideration and uh, like thinking back to like the, the pestle um, and all the political and economic and cultural factors that go into entering a new country, it's definitely wise to um, be very aware of those differences, especially between Asian countries, as a lot of them have um, cultural differences and like political differences as well that could, um, if you mess something up in your campaign, can have drastic effects on the way that um, yeah, your brand is perceived. And then also um, the language barriers as well. Um, since all these Asian countries have um, different languages and different cultural norms that come with those languages, um, it's very important to make sure that um, you get those uh, extremely clear and make sure that um, you're able to navigate through those. Terrific. John? Uh, I think they both did a great job of summarizing like some of the key things of what you need to bear in mind. And yes, you should not look at Asia as a singular entity, but there are those critical nuances that need to be accounted for. I won't repeat them. Um, I'll just give a simple example, a personal example of how, you know, not being aware or trying to maybe be too, too general in the spirit of efficiency of trying to get like a campaign, um, uh, to work across different Asian countries. Like we about two years ago, put a campaign out for the Ritz Carlton. Um, and it visually relied on white flowers and worked great in some countries and cut to China. And it's like, it's a symbol of death. It's what you, you know, of funerals and, you know, not what you want to communicate when you're trying to, to, um, you know, develop a positioning of luxury. So quickly had to change that. So you have to really understand <laughs> the differences in people in like communication platforms, because they will vary from country to country within Asia, um, purchasing power, purchasing habits, all of those things. Great. We're going to go to, we have a piece of data that Ivy is going to walk us through. Sorry, doesn't get old. I'll mute. <laughs> so um, 
is so social media use continues to grow. Um, no secret there. I mean, we know the sort of melting pot of uh, factors that will see that number grow. And some of them have to do with um, expanded internet access. People are more and more um, having access uh, to internet through efforts of major companies that are making that possible. Uh, the rise of mobile, obviously, the evolving features and functionalities out there, integration of social media into um, daily life. Um, you know, we want to be in touch with our family members and um, big brands know that, everybody knows that, social needs. So social media is seen as one of those um, elements of um, social connectedness and obviously the constant evolution of um, the social media landscape in general. So what you see there is kind of a very accurate forecast. We, our agency puts together a an annual bulletin with data that we collect from various sources. And this is one of those um, pieces of data points that we um, continue to evaluate. Is this growing? Yes, it is. Uh, why? Because technology is growing and people are getting more and more attached to um, how that works for social connectedness. So that's what it is. Why does it matter? Um, if you're a US company, trying to go to, um, you know, any Asian country, you will have to do in-depth research as to how that growing number is affecting that region in particular and what are the platforms that consumers are using to um, fulfill all those needs that um, I mentioned previously. And that will determine, you know, whether you have that infrastructure to sort of propose or deploy campaigns that are, viable through those platforms and how to um, do the right approach for channels for the right influencers that are performing on those platforms and so forth. And I think probably Celine and Brian have a better handle on, um, you know, how this is panning out. But we also looked at data for the monthly usage of major social platforms in China and the number of um, social media users in Japan. So we know this data, we, we know what that is in um, millions of users per month and so forth. And, you know, if, if you're in that decision making box of trying to get your company to any Asian market, you're gonna have to become a data maven in order to, be strategic enough to know what's going to work and what's not. So this is why that chart matters. So it may seem obvious that social media is growing around the world. What may be more challenging or complex for companies is the number of market or country specific platforms that exist within the social media umbrella, which I think relates to our next mm -hmm. question, which is um, given digital communication, social media, does it make it even more complex to manage brands at the local level? Like earlier, we talked about how digitization has made it maybe easier, but if you look at the other side of the coin, how do you maintain your brand voice um, kind of in a universal manner, but connect with local culture and language, given the popularity, the growth of social media, and the fragmentation of the different kinds of platforms that um, customers and individuals engage with. How about, on, that could be a good 98 question. Yeah. Let's start with um, Celine and Brian. You're the Gen Z representation here. <laughs> Save us. Yeah, I think um, it's definitely becoming, um, I think as consumers, we expect more from brands, especially when they operate on social media. So I think the complexity level in reaching a local audience has definitely uh, become higher. Um, so in that sense, um, yes, it's definitely becoming more complex. Um, but on the flip side, I think there's almost like a global culture that's emerging uh, with social media. So I think um, brands that are able to kind of tap into that and really hit on the zeitgeist and also bring trends across cultures um, definitely also has made uh, more like opportune uh, marketing opportunities for uh, businesses trying to enter different markets. 
Celine, so, same same to you. I mean, I've seen European companies that do an American Instagram handle. They do their UK. They do, or or maybe if it's language specific, they do their in language uh, Spanish. They do. I mean, how have you seen? How do you guys think you do a lot of social media for companies? How do you think about? maintaining a brand but also really meeting an audience where they are especially when it comes to the the hyper personalization of social media i think i was just thinking about that like would i rather follow at nike or at nike underscore sea for southeast asia like i probably more likely follow the global brand um i think when you've reached that level of a brand or the size of something like Nike, having those, you know, personalized accounts are helpful, like you said, for language purposes or perhaps running giveaways or sweepstakes that are more natural to a specific region. Um, for example, you know, here in Malaysia, we don't run a lot of giveaways because they're more likely perceived as scams, for example. So there's just those cultural nuances that could be really benefited from those hyper um, localized accounts. But at the grand scheme of things, what Brian was saying, like when we are looking at a brand and the brand affinity, like that global brand account on socials is, is pretty crucial. And without a doubt, you're going to leave certain audiences and niches out. Um, but I think it speaks to the brand core. Like what are the brand values that you want to share what, how is that, how does that translate onto socials? Um, and in a world where we very much respect and cry for transparency, I think that inherently will already automatically draw Gen Z's to either be a devotee or perhaps um, not necessarily a rejector, but perhaps skeptic of a brand or just neutral towards a brand. Quick time check. It's uh, shortly before six o'clock um, California time. So let's wrap up this question and then we'll, I think we have time for maybe one or two more topics of discussion. But before we move on, I wanted to see if John or I, if you had any thoughts on the, the you know, universal universality of, is that a word? Universality? Okay, it is, it now, is now. Of social media, but the undercurrents of market or country or even um kind of region specific um differences in the world of social media well celine touched on a really important one which is the ability to communicate with the local understanding like with the language um that's when social media and those handles become really really critical um but yes the importance of having that the the global brand voice through that handle or th to be to like set the set the standard um, and you know, the, the question you asked Andy was, is it harder? Does it like complicate things really? Um, it, and it, it can, you know, I mean, like having that level of, um, locality does put a added responsibility on like a brand team, for exa example, to really keep monitoring that or working with the local team who's maybe facilitating that local engagement to, while in the process of engaging locally, really maintain, you know, the essence of, of that brand and protect it um, through those local channels. So it does require some added orchestration because the, like you, there is an expected level of cadence and frequency that comes with having those platforms. I have a question and this is actually, this is, we're going to do Q and A at, at six. And this is, this is, I think, a uh, this is a little a little off script, maybe not, but um, with AI, the promise of AI, one of the promises from a marketing standpoint is super duper hyper personalization, like a campaign for John, a campaign for Ivy, a campaign like, have you guys thought at all about as the, the world of branding gets put through this hyper super duper personalized engine of the version of the brand for john the version of the brand for ivy the version of the brand for celine like 
what's that going to start to look like? And how are we going to start to manage it? And are there any conversations that you're seeing sort of at the agency or corporate level um, on how to, on how to manage this? I'll, I'll sort of let anyone jump in. This is a, this is a crystal ball type question. Um, I'll, I'll start. Um, we examined some data and specifically um, sort of the market size of artificial intelligence and marketing. And so we've looked at data for forecasts uh, and it's clear, it's going to continue growing. And one of those elements is obviously personalization. Um, so it's a, it's a ton of stuff there to unpack when it comes to AI and marketing or AI in marketing. But in particular, so you have the marketer perspective when it comes to AI and specifically personalization. And so marketers in general, especially surveys that we've seen, as long as you have better experiences and, uh, you know, consumer experience improved in general, it's going to be a thing that marketers are going to look at. And so um, it's no secret. AI is one of those ways that you have to ensure high degree of personalization. But then you have the consumer perspective on personalization as well. And there is data on that too. And independent of what region of the world you are, people are going to tell you X or Y. And so we know, for example, we've looked at data that um, shoppers, for example, um, nowadays, they do appreciate um, so personalized experiences and, and they would be willing to give up personal data just to get rid of thousands of generic advertising messages that are out there. Um, in general, consumers just don't like the one shoe fits everyone. So they want to be catered to and they know there is technology um, to do that. And so 43%, for example, of shoppers that were saved online worldwide were willing to share their personal data for the sake of a better tailored marketing experience. And many internet users are willing to share their email address and other information with companies to receive, for example, customized offers. So that's a fact. We cannot shy away from that. People know um, that, you know, there is a possibility to sort of be, it comes down to sort of psychology and neuroscience 101. And why are you talking to me like I'm somebody else? I'm me. And if you see me and you want to get to me, uh, talk to me. So you have the resources. Now, marketers also complained about the expensive um, sort of um, challenges that they have they have issues with 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 how expensive it is to deploy some of those technologies to actually get that level of personalization so there, there are these two sides that uh, you know come into this equation of um, you know consumers want personalization but do you have enough resources to actually do justice to the campaigns that you need to deploy in order to get to them so it's kind of an interesting one but the trend is um, the market share of artificial intelligence in marketing is going to continue growing as long as marketers see that as a major support for strategies for all sorts of reasons that are out there. <laughs> so enhanced customer experience, data-driven decision-making is not a secret that artificial intelligence can analyze vast amounts of customer data. And so you are going to make more informed decisions about campaign strategies, budget allocation, content creation, so that you can optimize stuff. And also it's going to free up market time and resources to focus on higher level strategy. And for as long as that continues to be the case, that uh, AI component into the marketing sphere is going to um, you know, continue to be a favorite. So too many aspects of, of this conversation can be subdivided into many different topics. But the data is clear. And so um, influencer marketing, shooting through the roof. And and we, I don't know if we're going to get a chance to talk about that or no, but I just wanted to give you very briefly because it's part of why um, this whole thing comes together. Um, we also looked at recent surveys and for example, Instagram continues to be the most popular platform for um, influencer marketing worldwide. That's the thing. And the market size has tripled since 2019. And in 2024, the market was estimated to reach a record of 24 billion US dollars 
just for influencer marketing and um, just in case we don't get to that slide, I just wanted to put it out there. And so when it comes to Asian markets and the US and companies trying to cross over, it is important to take into consideration, do you know who are the well-known creators on both sides of, of this market equation and, and how are you going to ensure um, your brand visibility and, and drive engagements and impact purchasing decisions for millions of users. So AI is part of that equation. Data and market research is part of that equation. So you have to be kind of armed with so many, you know, nuggets and important pieces of information um, that in order for, for brands and companies to be at the desired level of readiness to take these steps, um, you really need to know what you're doing and, and your team really needs to be prepped for with, with all this information. Thank you, Ivy. Um, so now's a great time to put your questions in the Q&A. One of our standout sophomore marketing students, um, sadly, I think has to leave. So Emma, watch the recording, but let's, um, let's get into her question. Um, she's a marketing student interested in uh, international global marketing, specifically with Asian companies. And she's wondering how important language is to global marketing positions. Is it an expected requirement to at least be bilingual? And then further, what hard skills would our four panelists recommend uh, starting to develop and trying to enter the global marketing realm? So language, other, other skills, hard skills, soft skills. Start with let's start with John on this one. John, from a <clears throat> presumably, hey, let me see. Emma is a sophomore marketing student. Presumably, Emma is an Ameri is American, interested in um, Asian marketing in Asia. Does she need? Does she need to be bilingual? Japanese. Not necessarily. I mean, I worked in a bilingual atmosphere, like environment. I worked overseas um, and I, I lived in Japan for three years and I can confidently say I am not fluent <laughs> in Japanese, shamefully. But it's because, you know, I we were developing comms and um, there were experts in that language. Um, and when I was in meetings with these different folks, it felt like the UN. We had headset on and I was on channel one, Every the Japanese speakers were on channel two, we had interpreters and we were able to successfully get the work done. I'm not gonna lie, like knowing the local language, if you're, especially if you are embedded locally is gonna help you just have a, an easier way of life. And if you are developing marketing work, certainly that is in the native language, if you're able to, you know, review copy um, and, and just be able to see and confirm if it makes sense is, is going to be that much better, but not, that is not a mandate um, to know, to be able to just fluently speak the local language. I wanted I, to add to that. So, sorry, John, I interrupted you. Yes, I think what is probably like what I would prioritize versus learning a local language is being curious and familiarizing yourself with the local cultural norms. Like I think behaviors more than anything and understanding that trumps knowing the language or being able to speak it natively because for the most part um, there is like the benefit of speaking English is that it is truly a global universal language. So you are more often than not find an English speaker wherever you are at. Um, and they will speak to you. They will do the, their best to accommodate and to um, you know engage. You will you will get further if you understand them behaviorally than if you're able to speak with them. Celine, I, I saw that you wanted to add something. I just wanted to give a brief two second. Um, I've lived and worked in three continents, including the Middle East. I don't speak Arabic. I never learned just the basic Habibi and so forth. And um, when I was there, I was executive vice president of a media company. Um, we had a multi, like an international team. And the strength of the, that's, and I'm saying this, not just to be specific to HMR, we have a lot of people from the Philippines and amazing talent from all over the world working there. The strength of that brand development actually came from 
having people that are native knowing the ins and outs of what needed to be done, not just from a language perspective, but from a cultural perspective. So I resonate with John, you know, you don't, and um, you don't need to be, I, I happen to speak a few languages, but not because it's required for the job or was never required for the job. It was just my cultural curiosity to learn. Um, and it's the same here in the US. Um, there's a ton of people who come from all over the world, more often than not people who speak English, but it's no set requirement. It's, if, if you bring it, it's amazing. I see um, there are major advertising agencies these days that seek that level of melting pot of cultures, even to go through processes of creating campaigns to being truthful to even diversity and inclusion. Uh, why would you have, for example, a Caucasian person giving advice on how the African-American market is going to receive certain pieces of information if you don't know the cultural sensitivities, for instance. So I just wanted to add that, uh, just to agree with John. No, you can be extremely successful at a career in international or global marketing as long as you do what John said. So there were times where it was Friday, it was 4 p.m. I am not a Muslim, but I would stop when there were there was prayer time. I'm not religious, but you respect the culture, you respect the sensitive, you know, you you just kind of learn to be part of that environment and people notice that you I didn't have to speak Arabic for that thank you here's another question well, actually I think Celine wanted to chime in on this one oh, it's sorry. okay I know we're short on time so we can we can Celine, jump right along go ahead my last thought was I agree with both what John and Ivy says I've grown up around the world um I'm considered a third culture kid. So I've, I've grown up in situations where I'm always in a in a place where English will not ever be the first language. I will say that when I see people higher in different parts of the world, especially at an entry level, second language is always helpful. I think um, if you come to Asia, like definitely, you know, you have you have the ability to figure out the new language, um, like try your very best. I think um, on, on a like community level, you'll find yourself having more support system if you do give that effort. Um, but at the same time, like the American English holds strong around the world. Like people want it, people feel like it's an extremely educated position. So I, I think that's something to leverage when looking for global positions. Let's, uh, let's move to one more question, and that is when a brand is based in the U.S. and is prioritizing U.S. sales, but it sells worldwide, how would you suggest going about influencer marketing? This is Screaming 98 answer. So when you're a brand based in the US and you're prioritizing US sales, but you sell worldwide on a global basis, how are you gonna form a, an influencer marketing strategy? I think really quickly, um, personally, I, I would say we're big fans of micro influencers. I think there's a lot more to leverage with smaller creators. Um, we find that working with creators who are on the smaller scale, one, they have more creative control. They're not going through managers for feedback, taking the extra time for deliverables. And two, they're, they're more willing to work with you on what you need. Um, again, especially on a platform like TikTok, you don't have to be from where you're from to sell to you know, your region. Like that's the, that's the joy of globalization and social media. You can totally, you can ask influencers for what their primary target audiences are. They can send you a quick screenshot of the percentage of people from the U.S. watching or Canada and so forth. Um, we've done that previously. We've done that. We've worked with Swedish influencers and Australian influencers for an app that's only available in the United States. Um, and we felt confident working with them because of the fact that their audience was primarily the U.S. 85% and above. Uh, any any other thoughts on the uh, managing influencer marketing on a on a global scale? Okay. Well, it's about six eleven, six twelve. Um, Dr. Peck, I know you need some. You want some time to to wrap up. So, let us all give our four panelists a big round of applause. A standing ovation. 
Uh, Dr. Peck, thank you for the opportunity to, um, to run this seminar, this webinar again. And audience members, participants, um, thank you for, for Zooming in with us tonight. Uh, thank you so much, Andy and Matt. Uh, once again, for moderating such a stimulating and enlightening panel discussion. It's been more than an hour since we started this webinar. As you see there, we still have more than 40 people attending this webinar. I can tell that these audience are so much engaged with your you know, the conversation and discussion. I think that we can continue this conversation throughout the whole night. Ivy, Celine, John, and Bryant, I can't thank you enough for sharing your experiences and insights with us today about this timely and intriguing topic. In particular, I'd like to thank Ivy for her mentioning FDI in California report because the LMU side actually that contributed a section entitled the Location Preference of FDI in California. As international companies are looking to expand into California, nothing is more important than probably the location. So they really have to deliberately choose where they want to locate their company. So understanding why and to what extent industries prefer a specific region can really help the investors make better decisions about their future locations. I know some of you have joined this webinar from different time zones. And I also like to thank all of you, the audience who joined this webinar today. I hope you enjoyed the, you have enjoyed the program and LMU side will be back with another program in the future. So until then, please stay safe and healthy. And before you leave, I would appreciate it if you can, if you could complete a short survey about this webinar. Once again, thank you so much, everyone, and good night.